Hello, good to have you with us again this morning. We're in the book of Revelation, and we are in chapter 20. This is a second part of where we were last week. We began by looking at the Millennial Kingdom, a, a literal 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. And today we're going to continue that thought. So just, just in review, this is what we saw last week as we were uh, looking at this momentous event that's coming, a uh, change that's coming in this world uh, for you and for me. The first thing that we see prior to the actual beginning of the Millennial Kingdom, we were reminded, is simply this, this passage in Matthew chapter 25, the sheep and the goats, where Jesus Christ will divide all those who are living at the end of the tribulation, believer and unbeliever, and will separate them. The believers will go into the tribulation. The unbelievers then will be judged by the Lord and thrown into the lake of fire. There will be no unbelievers that go into the millennial kingdom. That's important to understand. So the question is, who's going to be in the millennial kingdom? We talked about that last, last week. All believers. All believers of all time will be in the millennial kingdom. That's the Old Testament saints. That's the apostles and those who are represented there in the gospels. The church, which begins at Pentecost. It is tribulation martyrs, and it is the living tribulation believers as well who will begin to repopulate the earth, and it will flourish and it will grow. What are the purposes of the millennial kingdom? Some of those purposes, key, key to that is Christ, he is front and center, is to fulfill the prophecy of Jesus Christ. What the word of God says about the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ, how he is completing, fulfilling the will of his father, and reigning with his father as king of kings and lord of lords. It is to fulfill prophecy regarding Israel. God has kept his promises, will keep his promises to Israel. He is a promise keeper. They've not been met yet. Though all those promises have not been yet met yet. Israel has not lost her place. I believe the word of God is very clear that Israel is yet to receive those promises that God has given to her. We're going to see that even today. Uh, another purpose is to create a, a holy environment on the earth, similar to what we see when God created the, the gardens in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. We see that. And it is to answer prayer. You know, the great prayer that we pray, the Lord's Prayer, or the disciples' prayer that we see there, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That prayer is answered here. And we pray that even today that that would be true in our lives. So what are some of the realities of the coming millennial kingdom? I want us to look at that. We're not going to cover everything about the millennium. We can't. We don't have time to do all that. We're doing some of that in our, in our small groups, our growth groups as well. But let me look at a few things together with you this morning. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you with the word of God. So let's do that. Number one, the thing that we see here, again, it's about Christ. He will dwell specifically on the earth. He will dwell in Israel. We see that here, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. He, when he comes with all of his angels, with the church with him as well, with you and I, he will sit on his glorious throne. Jeremiah prophesied this, that, that his, uh, Messiah would reign, Jesus will reign. The days are coming when he shall reign as king. That's exactly what we see here. He will now reign in Jerusalem. He will reign in Israel. He will reign over the earth as king. That is the fulfillment of God's word. And it is the reality of what's going to take place. Jesus is going to be here on earth dwelling among men. God is going to be dwelling among men, as it were, in Christ with us through the person of Jesus Christ. His name will be called the Lord is our righteousness. He will be here forever. He will dwell with man forever. He says, I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place shall be with them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And so Jesus Christ is going to rule. He's going to reign on his glorious throne. He's going to be in Jerusalem. He's going to reign from there on the earth over the entire earth. The world itself, what will the world do during this time, during these thousand years? The world will come to Jerusalem under the reign of Jesus Christ. The world will come to Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the centerpiece of the world. Uh, the Jerusalem, Israel will be the, the place, the focal point of all the cities, all the nations, all the kingdoms of this world. They will come to her to worship. Isaiah chapter 2 makes this very clear. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord, all nations shall flow to it. That's Jerusalem. 
That is, that is Israel. That is where God is ruling and reigning physically in form in the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God is with Israel. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from the, na from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Everything's going to change. God's people from Israel will be walking with the Lord the, nation, the nations of the world will recognize that this is where Christ is. This is where the glory of God is. We want to be there. God is blessing the Jews in a very specific, special way, and it will be recognized by the world. The world will come to learn and to grow. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. It is, it is the place to learn, to grow, to see Christ. It is Israel. It's where the temple will be. It's where God will manifest himself in Christ. It will be a house of prayer. My holy mountain will be called and is a house of prayer. My house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. All the nations will come. How, what a contrast to today. Christians are not flocking to Israel. Christians are not flocking to the Holy Land to worship as we see in the sense here. The world in its totality will come to Christ. The world will know God. The nations will worship Him. Zechariah, everyone who survives of all the nations that have come up against Jerusalem, that's at the end of the tribulation, all the nations who were represented, and yet there are believers in those nations that survived, shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, to keep the Feast of Booths. And so believers who survived the tribulation will represent every nation, every tribe, every tongue. They will come into the Millennial Kingdom. The nations will come to Israel, and they will worship. Habakkuk says this, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. His the knowledge of God will permeate the earth. It's going to be taught everywhere, in every city, in every community, in every location. It'll be taught. It'll be emphasized. It'll be expected. It'll be upheld as the Word of God. Holy living will be the norm on this earth. Right now, we are aliens. We are strangers on this earth. We don't fit in. We don't fit into the to the to the uh, world view of the nations around us. We don't fit into to the values and the expectations of this world. But now we will have, of course, new bodies, incorruptible, the mind of Christ, the body of Christ, and yet also the nations, those who are, who are flesh and blood, who are being born, they will, they will know of Christ, and holy living will be the norm among the nations. Jeremiah 31.3, a new covenant. The new covenants was going to be fulfilled here in the millennial kingdom. The Lord says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. Even, even We even have uh, the reality of that now in the church through the Holy Spirit who lives within us. God is putting His law in our heart, writing it on our hearts. That's what He's doing. It will be now fulfilled for Israel, for the world, for those who are in Christ. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. It's going to come from the heart, this, this thing called holiness before the Lord, right? That we strive for, pray for. It'll be the habit. It'll be the habit of all believers. A highway shall be there. It shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. The, the highway to Jerusalem, the, the, the path to Jerusalem to come and to worship, a literal path, a spiritual path. The way of a believer will be this way. It is the way of holiness. It is the way of giving my heart to Christ, to following after Christ for us who are who are in Christ, new bodies for all eternity. It is it is the entirety of who and what we are. No capability for the believer who has who has been transformed by Christ to sin. But there will be those who live on this earth in human bodies who yet will need to receive Christ. And when they do, they will be need to walk in holiness before the Lord, as we are expected to now and today. It'll produce a hatred of idolatry. I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, so that they shall be remembered no more. I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. The prophets are just the, the messengers. They're the mouthpiece of wickedness, of idolatry. Those mouthpieces are going to be removed. There won't be a, a media that speaks out against Christ and, and promotes uh, 
satanic and wicked and evil values, there will be there will be the presence of the holiness of God. Idolatry will be removed from the earth. It will not be allowed. It will be judged swiftly by Jesus Christ. Holiness will be expected. From the new moon to new moon, from the Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me. This is the expectation that God will have for his people during these 1,000 years of reign. And then he will again make a final distinction at the end of those 1,000 years, and we will move into eternity. And we will be one people. The curse is going to be lifted from creation. We see that as well. Genesis chapter, chapter 3 Creation is now cursed. We see that to Adam. He said, because of Adam's sin, cursed is the ground because of you. All of creation has been cursed because of sin. When we pull weeds and we work in the garden and we sweat and we toil at work, and just the sweat and the labor of, of, of living in this earth and this environment and the humidity and the heat and the extreme colds and the climate change, as you could say, and all those things, it's all representative of the curse that God placed upon this earth because of sin. It is a reality. We're told in Romans chapter 8 that, that all of creation groans. All of creation is aware of, this, of the spiritual burden that's been placed upon it because of sin. And creation is groaning to be released from the curse that man brought to it when Adam sinned. Adam and Eve sinned. And creation is under the curse of sin. And that's why we see the results, the impacts of, of sin throughout this earth, even in nature and all around us. We see, we see it daily, all the time, catastrophes and disasters and extremes and weather and famine and all of those things that take place. It is because the earth is presently under the curse of sin because of Adam. That curse will be lifted. We see this in Isaiah 11. I believe this is literal. Uh, not at all symbolic. I believe it's a description of what's going to take place in the millennial kingdom. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf, and the lion, and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall graze together. The young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. Those are things that are completely contrary to nature today. In all those descriptions, if it took place today, they would be death, dying, destruction. But when the curse is lifted, God will bring a harmony to all of the animal kingdom, to creation itself. And man will be blessed by that, benefit from that. The the creation will be blessed by that, benefit from that as well. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so not just people will have a knowledge of God. Creation, remember Jesus says if, when, the, when the Pharisees and Sadducees pled with Jesus to, to silence his disciples and those who are following him because of their worship, he says, if I do that, even the rocks will cry out. Even, even in some way that we don't understand, creation is aware of the presence of its creator, Jesus Christ. And it will also uh, benefit from this curse being lifted. And what a beautiful thing that will be. There will be prosperity during the millennial kingdom. It will be upon the whole earth. There will be no famine. Ezekiel chapter 36, I will summon the grain. I will make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, you, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations, specifically there to Israel, but also in the world. But God will judge sins and nations who, who rebel against him. If there is a nation who refuses to come up to Jerusalem, a nation who refuses to follow God will judge that nation. Famine may be a part of that judgment. There are descriptions of God's judgment upon those who will not follow in the millennial kingdom. So we clearly have that. But the world itself will not come under, again, the curse of famine, as it were, unless there is sin. Israel itself will not, because Israel will be following after God's own heart. There will be fruitfulness on the earth. I will send showers in their season. There shall be showers of blessing, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land. And just It's, it's a beautiful picture. And there'll be no homeless and no one who's hungry. They shall build houses and they will inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and they will eat their fruit. 
They shall not build and another inhabit and not plant and another eat. And God is, they're going to enjoy the work of their hands we see here. God is going to bless. He's going to bless. In this world, there will be that blessing of those who are following after Jesus Christ and Israel specifically as well. There will be an overabundance. Amos 9. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Again, just that the fertile crescent in the Middle East will be the fertile crescent again, and the world will be fertile, and Israel specifically will be the recipient of all these blessings, specifically as a nation, and, and will be under the absolute blessing of God then and forever. And the world will also uh, experience the fruit of these blessings upon the earth. There will be, there will be uh, healing. There will be health that we see here that takes place. Um, Isaiah chapter 35, there will be limited disease. And the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. Folks, these are miracles. God is going to bring healing. Uh, disease will be limited because there is still sin on the earth. We're going to speak to that. There still will be disease. There still will be death. There still will be these things. But in the general totality of the experience of all those in the millennial kingdom, there will be this blessing of God's healing, um, that, that curse of sin being l limited upon the disease of man, the curse of creation being lifted, the curse of sin being muted, but still there because there are still sinners here on the earth. There will be healing that takes place. He gives us a picture here of the temple. This temple that is in Jerusalem that God has built during this millennial kingdom and our, and our water flows from the temple and it becomes a river that flows east from the temple on both sides of that river. There, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail. They will bear fresh fruit every month. The water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. God is going to, you know, it's amazing how many times, think about this, how many treatments for healing are already present in this world but are muted by the curse of sin. Just the things in nature. There are many who believe in, in, in just a, a, a total use of those herbal medicines and natural remedies and all those things. And, and God is going to just going to heighten exponentially the ability of, of nature to do what he's always intended, to bring healing. And then God himself. There will be long life as a result of just this blessing, these blessings as well. We see before the flood, we see here Methuselah lived 969 years, the longest man who ever lived. Many lived up till the flood many, many hundreds of years, Methuselah being the longest, because of God's protection of a canopy over the earth and all those kind of things. And now when the millennial kingdom comes, that's going to change. So right now, Psalm chapter 90 verse 10 tells us the years of our life are 70. And even by strength of, by reason of strength, 80. And some live to be 100. And, and man and scientists are always trying to lengthen our life. But we'll never lengthen our life to, to those earlier years before the flood until Jesus Christ comes and he brings a complete change on this earth. This world will change completely. Isaiah 65. No more shall there be an infant who lives but a few days. Just the heartache of losing a, a loved one, a child, an infant, a baby. Or will there be an old man who does not fill out his days? For the young man shall die a hundred years old. If someone young dies, it'll be a hundred years old. But it says here, a, the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. If someone dies young like this, it will show the presence of sin in their life. Most likely from what we see here. And um, God is going to lengthen our lives. It may be that those who are born maybe live all the way through the millennium. It may be that, that they die and the scripture doesn't tell us what happens after that. It just doesn't give us that answer. But we know God will be, will be faithful and true to, to that believer. We just don't know if, if, if every believer who makes it through the millennial kingdom will live the entire millennial kingdom. It doesn't tell us. We don't know. So I, I cannot tell you that and I cannot say for sure. I can make assumptions, but that's all they are. There will be peace on this earth during the millennial kingdom. Isaiah chapter 2, the nations, all of the nations, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, 
neither shall they even learn the art of war anymore. All of our military academies will be gone. All of these standing armies and our soldiers and the military will not exist. There will be no navies. There will be no marines, no seals. There will be no special elite forces. There will be none of those things. Those that we venerate, that give their lives for our nation, there will be no need for that during the Millennium Kingdom. It simply won't exist. No nations will have defensive forces, offensive forces. There will be no threats, no weaponry, none of those things. Ezekiel 37 tells us, I will make a covenant of peace with them, with Israel. And ultimately, it's with all of us, all believers who have been resurrected to step into the millennial kingdom. That covenant of peace is with us. That's what we are experiencing then, day in and day out. I will make a covenant of peace with them, Israel. It shall be an everlasting covenant. Israel will never again not know peace. The world will experience peace. Isaiah 32, the effect of righteousness, of walking, being right with God, will be what? It will be peace. The result of righteousness will be quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings and a quiet resting place. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? It's, folks, it's, it's, not, it's not mythological. It's not, something, it's not a fairy tale. Folks, this is the word of God being fulfilled. It's, it's going to happen. This is God's promises. Has He not been faithful to you? I just want you to consider how beautiful these things are, what it means for us today. There will be joy, absolute joy in the millennial kingdom. We see that here as well. Isaiah chapter 9. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy, and they rejoice before you as with the joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoils of, of war here in this context, in this setting. Isaiah 14. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. And what do they do? They break forth into singing. Just the, just the joy of the Lord that we see here. There's going to be spiritual blessing upon the earth. Matthew chapter 25, God will reward. Well done. That's what we'll, that all of us who step into the millennial kingdom as, as transformed believers because we have been faithful he will God then reward. He says, I will set you over much. And then this is the words that are so exciting. To all the believers who step into the eternal kingdom and experience the blessing of the millennial kingdom, this is what he'll say. Enter into the joy of your master. It, it is joy. It's joy. It's spiritual blessing. And God will give us reward. God will, God will give us opportunity, responsibility because of our faithfulness to him. It'll be blessing beyond measure. The king will say to those on his right, sheep and the goats, to all the sheep, all those who are his, uh, come, you who are blessed, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Uh, the kingdom is blessing beyond description. Uh, every believer will experience its fruit, its joy, its blessing, its strength uh, for, for a thousand years and then into all eternity. Folks, we can't even comprehend how beautiful that'll be. And uh, that'll be a joy. Again, I'm going to finish with a, a same thread that we did last week. Because it's a sobering reminder to us. Yet, here's what we find as we look at the reality of the millennial kingdom. Sin is still going to be present. You're going to have all the believers of all time enter the millennial kingdom together. You're going to have those who survive the tribulation, who are believers, the sheep, at the judgment of the sheep and the goats, who are brought into the millennial kingdom. And, and they're going to have families. God is going to bless this earth they're going to live a long life. They're going to see the blessing of God. They're going to flourish. This population is going to absolutely explode because of the conditions of the earth, the, the promises of God, the blessings of God. And humanity, real humanity, flesh and blood, not those who have been resurrected, the people are going to be born by the probably the billions in a thousand years, are you kidding? And the earth is going to be filled and repopulated, and God is God has redone the earth and remade the earth in a sense as we come out of the tribulation. We saw that as we looked at it. There will be topographical changes that will happen, geographical changes that will happen throughout all the earth. And the world will be fit and able to provide for all who are being born. And it will be a place of blessing. God is God is going to bring his richness into the experience of every man, woman, and child. And yet there's still going to be the reality of sin. And that speaks to us today. Got to remember that this whole thing, this spiritual battle, this thing that we face today, 
and is a reality all the time. It goes clear back to the Garden of Eden. You know that. And we see that in Genesis 6. When Eve saw the tree, here's what she saw. She was There was deception that took place there. She saw the tree. She saw it was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. It just looked fabulous. The tree was desired to make one wise. She saw it had qualities that she wanted and felt like she didn't have, right? And so what did she do? She de- she was deceived. She was told, they were told, don't eat of that tree. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. You can eat of any fruit of any tree in the garden. Not that one. They were given an opportunity to show an, an absolute love for God by obeying Him. And yet, and yet she was deceived here and she took a piece of that fruit and she ate it and... And this world has never been the same because of the sin that took place there on that day. Genesis chapter 3 tells us this. The Lord said to the woman, what, what have you done? What is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. Now, you know, there's a couple ways to look at that. Many of us have always assumed that when she said that, she's blaming the serpent. It may be, an, we don't hear tone of voice here. It may absolutely be, yeah, that's what took place. But it may also be this, just the reality of a true statement. The serpent, he deceived me. And in humility and contriteness, she's saying before her Lord, this is what took place. I was deceived in humility and brokenness. We, we don't know. It could, have been in, uh, it could have been a defensive mechanism and it could have been a blaming mechanism. It could have been all that. It could have been a contrite, broken mechanism expression that was given. But here's what we know. When she sinned, she was deceived because there was a deceiver who was there. That is Satan. We know that. And she was deceived. She made a choice. She made a choice in deception. Now in Revelation 20, as we started here, we're in Revelation 20, we saw verses 2 and 3, Satan is bound for a thousand years so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years are ended. After that, he must, he must be released for a little while. So Satan and I believe all of his forces, I believe all the demonic forces are bound because their goal, their power is deception. God has clearly said there will not be deception taking place on the earth during the millennial kingdom. I believe they're all bound with him, their captain. There is no deception on the earth. Now just think about that. There's no deception on the earth. There's no media telling you lies. Uh, the world is not promoting its view in front of your face 24-7. There is not deception taking place. There is not a spiritual force of deception taking place in the world, from the world, to the people of the world. Satan has been bound. His power to deceive has been bound. Think about that. That's, that's incredibly important. It takes place. That deceptive element of Satan's work is removed from the earth. There is not a competitor working against the authority of Jesus Christ in that sense. The competitor, Satan, has been removed. He is bound in his sin. The environment of the earth during the millennial kingdom is one of God's blessing, God's riches, God's expectation of holiness and obedience People are being born. Flesh and blood people are being born. They're living a life as you and I live life now. God places on them as he places on you and I the expectation. He places upon us the obligation to make a choice. What will I do with Jesus Christ? Now you would think that in this environment, that in a perfect environment, the majority of the world would absolutely follow Jesus Christ. And they will on the outside. All those who have been resurrected, that first resurrection here in this chapter 20, all of those are incapable of sin. We will be incapable of sin. We will be as the Lord was when He was here on the earth. Incapable of sin. We will live among sinners, but be incapable of sin, just as Jesus Christ was. That's really important to know and understand. But I want to remind you of what we saw last week. Here's the reality. Here's a reality statement, reality check. Yet there will be an inward rebellion that will persist. Why? Where does this come from? How does this work? Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart. The heart is naturally 
deceitful above all things. It's desperately sick. It's desperately wicked. Who can understand it? For every individual who was born on this earth, they are born with the same heart that is sinful as your heart and mine is when we were born on this earth. Satan is not here to deceive. But what does this say? We are born with a heart that not only is sinful, we are born with a heart that is what? What's the word? It's deceptive. Because sin resides in us when we are born. Sin is the nature that controls us when we are born. That is the curse of sin. The curse over creation has been lifted. The curse over sin has not yet been fully destroyed. It was at the cross. The victory has already been won, but it hasn't been realized yet. It's going to happen at the end of the millennial kingdom. So, so the realities, the presence, the power of sin within the heart is still there. And so when we come to the end of the millennial kingdom, there's going to be excuses made by unbelievers, and Jesus will say, I gave you a perfect environment, and yet you chose to not follow after me. Why? Because of the influence of sin, not from out there, not from deception out there. You chose not to follow after me because of the deception, because of the sin, the deception within your own heart. And you will not listen to truth that will permeate the entire world. This is important to see as well. You think, well, this is that, that's new. No, it's not new. It's always been that way. It's never changed since Adam and Eve, Genesis 3. When Eve gave some of that fruit to her husband, he was already with her. When she took a bite, he was already there. He watched. He was with her. So 1 Timothy 2.14 says, And Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived. Adam was not deceived. And then that, well, that's really powerful. It tells us that Adam was there when Eve was considering what to do, and Eve was looking at that tree, and Eve was talking to herself or talking with him, and however that was going on, or none of that is communicated to us, Adam was there, and he was watching, and it, the scriptures clearly tell us that Eve was deceived. She believed a lie because she was deceived. Adam was not deceived. So that only leaves this option. Adam willfully rebelled against God with an open mind and with a clear understanding. He knew what he was doing. He knew that what God had said. There was no ambiguity in his heart. He understood the consequences, and yet he went along with his wife, and he did that. That reality is going to be true in the millennial kingdom. There will be many who live in a, in a perfect world, as it were. Yes, still will sin but with holiness being over the environment of the whole world. A, a, a government that is not corrupt, a world establishment that is not corrupt, that is holy, the kindness, the blessing of God upon the whole world for a thousand years, and in that environment, the sin of our heart will still have impact in this way. I just, I just want you to, to know and, and remind you and challenge you how... How terribly destructive the sin nature in our own hearts is. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior right now, you've won the victory over that, but it is still a spiritual battle in your heart every day. The hardest battles you will ever face, and the hardest battles you will face this week, in any situation that you face, the hardest battle is from your own heart first. When you conquer that in prayer, when you conquer that by faith in Christ, when you conquer that by yielding to the power of Christ, then you are empowered to face whatever that obstacle represents. It's the sin in our heart that brings us to defeat. And the millennial kingdom will be transformed. Now we're not. We've got to make choices just like the believers, just like, just like those in the millennial kingdom have to make. Will they follow after Christ or not? And so just a challenge to you, a final challenge here to all of us is just this. We need to pray over our own hearts. Right now, here, now, in our life, as we walk with the Lord, this is what we need to pray. We need to pray over our own hearts. Psalm 139. God, just search me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. God, look into my heart. God, I gotta want you to look into my heart. I want you to see who I am inside. That's, that's important. I'm going to yield to your gaze. God, I want you to see me. Try me and know my thoughts. Test me. Test my heart. Test my, my thought life. 
Test what I'm thinking. Test where I'm at in my mind. Test where I'm at emotionally. God, where am I at with you? God, I want you to see all of that. God, I want I want no barriers between me and you. I want you to see it all. That's the prayer that you and I need to lay before the Lord. That's what I want. God, I want you to see that in my life. And see, God, I, I'm praying this because I want you to see, is there anything in my life that offends you? See if there is any grievous way in me. Is there anything in my life that offends you? Is there anything in my life that... It hurts you. Is there anything in my life that's contrary to your heart? And we need to let Jesus Christ, with His Word, we need to let the Spirit of God take the Word of God and, and gaze into our life. That's again why you must be a student of God's Word. Let the truth of His Word look into your life because that's what the Spirit uses. And lead me. God, lead me in the way everlasting. The Hebrew there is lead me in the ancient paths which are is an everlasting way. Lead me in that way that has always been true, will always be true. It's the holy path of the Word of God. That is true. And in your faith, may it simply just fill you with, with, uh, with God's hope and God's power, God's joy, God's peace, all that reality. Romans 5, 13. May the God of hope fill you. May it fill you. The reality of what's coming, the reality of what's true to us now. May it fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you might abound in hope. God wants us to be open to Him so that we, so that we are always on guard and so that we are uh, honest to Him. And He wants us to be filled with, with the hope of His promise that that would become power and living. The Millennial Kingdom... There's a lot more that we could say. We haven't answered all your questions, and, and I can't, and it's not my intent. It's to give you, it's to whet your appetite for what, what God's going to do, His promises. And it's to whet our appetite for holy living now. What is going to be true then of all believers who are transformed, God wants to be true of our life now. He wants us to live with those passions in our life right now. That's what He wants for you and I. May the Lord touch your heart with uh, this passion, this reality. Thanks for... Thanks for joining us again to just walk through Revelation to learn and to grow. May God bring it into your life and use it for His glory to continue to transform you and to change you so that you are like Christ. Amen, amen. Thank you. We'll see you next week.